should religious scientists live under a cloud of suspicion? Uh, and if their religion informs their science, what are we to make of that? Is it contaminated? Mm. And I think it's very important to recognize that there are multiple ways of being a scientist who happens to be religious. Um, and I've learned this over time. So I've been wrong on this topic and I've in coming into contact with high, higher quality scientists motivated by religion, I've come to understand that there's a subpopulation that is very special and interesting. And it's effectively a population of people who agree to the rules of science. They're not going to cheat on the rules of science because Jesus, but they are going to use the idea of purpose and a personal relationship with God to give them courage to question things that are essentially unquestionable within the uh, union of scientists that will get you thrown out of the union of scientists very quickly, as to your point. So what we're talking about is we're talking about relatively self-destructive scientists focused on science who get their courage from religion and some of their bearings and their focus uh, so, for example, um, many of these people do not believe that there's a persuasive case for random mutation as being the major engine of selection. They believe that uh, it is simply improbable, and they point to very often the Wistar Conference held at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wistar Institute, um, and they, 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 they try to say this is a live issue where the books got closed prematurely and in fact, it's the atheists, according to them, who were led into error because they were trying to close the books desperately so as not to leave any gap large enough uh, for a god to be smuggled into the canon of science. I am persuaded that the Richard Dawkins of the world, who have contributed, in my estimation, hugely to modern evolutionary theory, are so afraid of dealing with religious colleagues that they were eager to shut the books and not give many of these people their due. And what's more, um, the concept of intelligent design is a really interesting one. Now, my brother, who uh, I think has just brilliant turns of phrase and insights into evolutionary theory, one of his, you know, Richard Dawkins, I think, wants to be remembered for the meme not, not as the uh, the the, the, the gif uh, that, mm -hmm. that um, gets sent over Twitter, but the meme and the extended phenotype is his greatest contributions. And I think one of Brett's um, better ideas is understanding perception-mediated selection. It is very clear that when you have uh, various breeds of dog, they are intelligently designed. When you produce a mule from a donkey and a horse that is not a natural animal, you are producing an intelligently designed animal when you create orchid varieties. So in all of these cases, you have to admit that Darwinian theory has perception-mediated selection, uh, the display of bower birds, um, where they build these structures and adorn them with blue in some cases. Perception-mediated selection is a form of endogenous design which is intelligent because it is mediated through perception. Right. It's a good place to study it because the words intelligent design have been made radioactive, right? right? And so what we're arguing about is should the, should the books have been closed uh, with the neo-Darwinian synthesis or should they have been left open? And I, I have to say, I, I really think that without the religious scientists who are willing to destroy themselves and their careers, but who still do not wish their love of a benevolent God or a, a fearsome Old Testament God or, or, or a personal Jesus Christ, I believe that many of those people are responsible for prying the books open when Dawkins and company wished to close them prematurely. And I'm honestly sympathetic with the Dawkins perspective. I cannot stand what I've called Jesus smuggling, uh, where you're in some very careful argument and you know, you've know you set everything up and then somebody sort of says, well, I just believe that God's love pervades everything. You're just like, oh brother, do I really have to listen to this? Um, on the other hand, 
going toe to toe with some of these religious scientists is an eye opening experience because mm -hmm. they are highly motivated not to not, they know that they're heretics. And if you think about, let's say, um, Galileo's heresy, they are in some sense the heretics of today, and their reputations are burned at the stake. They're not they're not Bruno in uh, sixteen hundred in the square. Mm -hmm. But I think that what we have to say is that many of these people are making points that atheists wish would go away. What is the strongest? Or some? Give me a couple of. Uh <clears throat> arguments from design that appeal intellectually? Well, uh, I, I'm particularly motivated by two systems uh, in perception-mediated selection, one of which has to do with the Lampacillus muscle, which uh, produces a meaty lip that extends outside of its shell in clearly the form of a bait fish for bass in clear streams. And when... A bass swims by, the mussel wiggles this little piece of meat that is outside, and it looks exactly like a fish in the stream. And the bass sometimes fall for it, and sometimes see the ruse. But if they fall for it, the bass uh, clamps down on the lip, and all of the young of the mussel, of the Lampacillus mussel, um, diffuse into the gills of the bass, clamp on to get a blood meal, and are taken away by the... Um, bass to distribute them in the stream where the muscle doesn't have the ability to spread its young. There is no way you can tell me that that isn't an intelligently designed system and it's the bass that is the intelligence. And the bass is specifically designing its own fooling, its own its self-deception because dumber bass have fell for this trick before and smarter bass uh, didn't fall for it, and that pushes the selective pressures in order to produce this. Now, there's a closely related system that is not based on predation, which is the bass system, but is based on uh, sexual reproduction, and that has to do with the ophrys system in orchids. So there's this one sort of clade of orchids um, where, you know, I talk about this a lot, Darwin, I, I asked the question one day, what did Darwin do after Origin of Species? Like, how do you follow yourself <laughs> or an encore? And he wrote this book, which I couldn't believe the title, which was on the various contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects. And I thought, that is the dumbest <laughs> thing I can possibly imagine. But Jedi Darwin being Darwin was incredibly smart. Or orchids are incredibly speciated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're a great system in which to study various mechanisms. Now, if you read that, Darwin does not understand why the Ophrys orchid makes a replica of the species that pollinate it, particularly the females, with using its lowest of five petals, I believe, and producing incredible pheromones that are almost indistinguishable from the pheromones produced by a female who is receptive to mating. And you watch Darwin trying to figure out why this would be, and he can't figure out that this is actually a consequence of his own theory, because the theory is too new. And it's just like one of the most beautiful vignettes, and nobody talks about it. And so what I would say is, in that situation, a male does tries to copulate with the flower, not realizing that it's not a female. And if it, it's fooled twice, then the flowers don't have to give up an expense, an energetically expensive nectar meal. And they can, they can be very cheap about it. All they have to do is to offer an ersatz sexual experience. Mm -hmm. And this is called pseudo copulation. So in both of these systems, if you look at the mirror orchid, for example, it's a stunning replica with hair and the shininess on the back, and this whole the, the whole thing, you can tell what is fooling the pollinator. Now, both of these are systems in which that which is dumber is fooling that which is smarter using the intelligence, the bounded intelligence of the thing being fooled to intelligently design a trap. And both of these are effectively parasites because they're stealing energy from the dupe and that energy is used to further the species in an antagonistic fashion. Um, if I make that point and I say, actually, intelligent design is all through the animal kingdom. It's just not what you think. It's not a question of an initial creator who's deciding, you know, the unmoved mood or saying you're, you're an aardvark, uh, you're a eucalyptus tree. So endogenous intelligent design is essential to Darwinian theory within Brett's context of perception mediated selection. And then what do you get from the uh, atheistic science community? It's like, 
We will have no such discussion. 